We're glad to have you with us this evening in this continuing study of the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to try to hurry it up a little bit because I'm afraid with it being once a month, as I said last month, we'll just drag it out longer than what we need to. When that happens, you forget what you studied the first part of the book, try to remember the second part. Uh, we'll start with chapter four. Let's try to keep in mind that Solomon is the preacher, as he would call himself, or as it's called in the book, that because he is uh, uh, wise, God gave him that wisdom. Because he asked that wisdom to know how to use, uh, to know how to govern his country, God says, since you didn't ask for riches and so on, I'm going to give you all of those things too. But again, Solomon is a free moral agent. And obviously, he chose to do a lot of things that a godly man should not do. As he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, he's talking about man's conduct under the sun. The idea of under the sun continues to surface. And it means simply while we're here on earth. What's the point of it all? What's the purpose of life? People have been told that they need to learn to ask, where did they come from? What are they here for? Where are they going? The atheist, of course, says that you just accidentally are here. And when you end your earthly existence, there is no other existence. But of course, when we look at this particular book in chapter 3 and verse 11, we learn that he has set eternity in man's heart. Thus, there is a yearning for a number of things, even in the minds of those that try to deny the existence of God, that cannot be explained except that there's a spirit in man. And God, as the Hebrews writer said, is the father of our spirits. So there is a certain way to live life that is a right way to live life. Therefore, there's a wrong way to live life. In uh, chapter four, we want to note uh, and think about the preacher's obligations or, uh, to set out what he sees. And he is observing all that he has gleaned from his search for the purpose of life under the sun. Another thing is to consider the vanity of skillful work of isolation, and of even popularity. And a third point I would say we should take away from chapter four is to appreciate the value of friendship and working together. Now, let me point out as we note that, seeing that we are aware of all of the Bible teaches and that it unfolds the great scheme of redemption and how that God would bring all men together with him in the blood body of Christ, that this oneness, this friendship, this working together, uh, the value of life, ultimately finds itself revealed in the teachings of the New Testament concerning the church, the body of Christ, or the family of God. For well, there's where we really learn the value of friendship and working together. He will close out um, three by pointing out that who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth down unto the earth. Again, that emphasizes what I was saying a while ago. Uh, animal life as God created it simply ceases to be when it ceases its biological existence. But that's not the case with man. Man has a spirit that is created in the likeness of God and that it is immortal and thus uh, it returns to God who gave it. Now, in chapter four, the preacher continues to share his observations that, again, he's gathered during the course of his search of the purpose of life under the sun. Uh, you'll notice back over in chapter three and verse 16, he's already related the injustice that he saw on the earth. And we could say the same thing today. Uh, men seek to be just 
but even those who claim to be on the side of justice, many times they're perverted and thus they pervert justice. But when we look at uh, God's justice, because God is perfect, and we know the Bible says God is love, but it also means he's a God of justice. So there's perfect justice with God. This time in life on earth is a time of testing, a time of learning, a time of preparing. The, you might say, the review of our life at the end of the course of life, if you want to call it that, is simply the judgment where we are judged according to the way we lived on this earth, as far as Christians are concerned, with the New Testament being the standard by which God judges us through Jesus Christ. So we're told how he considered those who were oppressed. And in life, many times, those who are oppressed, treated badly, they don't have any comfort. And yet you'll notice as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the earthly work of our Lord, he constantly goes about showing the comfort that God provides. Uh, we don't have to wait till we get to the New Testament to see that either. That's brought out even in the old. But you'll remember Christ pointed out when he was answering uh, the disciples of John when John sent them to him to say, are you the one who look for another? One of the things he mentioned was that the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Well, that destroys the idea that all that there is to uh, being righteous and godly and faithful in the Lord's church is simply clothing people and feeding people and taking care of their medical needs for their body. It's obvious that being in a benevolent uh, institutions such as the church that were mindful of the terrible straits other people are in in this life. But the ultimate is the eternal life that is offered by the gospel, God's power to save us. And this, of course, has to be the end result of the message of Ecclesiastes because ultimately every book of the Old Testament leads us to the New Testament. Uh, he pointed out that if you're in the state of affairs where you just conclude there's no comfort at all, as he did mention that in chapter four, uh, in such a state, then he concludes that the dead were better than the living. And that's not the case. Uh, God is the God of the living and not of the dead meaning that because we cease our existence in the flesh on this earth doesn't mean we cease our existence. It means that we simply cease the place whereby we prove to God we either love him and will obey him no matter what, or we won't. So ultimately, the new, without the New Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes would sort of leave us hanging as to well, what is the purpose of life on earth? Where do we get ultimate comfort? How do we have the peace that Christ promised that passes all understanding? So he concludes this person who uh, looks at life as he did, that if there's nothing beyond what we do from day to day in the flesh, then we'd do better never have been born. And that's the first uh, four verses of chapter four uh, brings that out. He simply concludes, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The preacher then describes what he saw as the vanity, remember that means pointless or useless, vanity of toil and skillful work, especially when one is alone. There's no one with him. He has no human um, companionship. And while one who does nothing, just absolutely does nothing is a fool and thereby he gets nothing out of life, whatever there is here to get out of it. He says it's better to have a little bit with quietness, or we might say it this way, to have a little with peace of mind than a lot 
with much harm. I think if you look over the histories of great many people who are wealthy and powerful, or you read the biographies that are out there of these people, many times they're not very happy people. They may give us the appearance that they are, but so many times they're not. A grave misfortune is that person with no companion, no son, no daughter, no brother, no family who is laboring intensely, endlessly for riches, but they don't satisfy him. And he doesn't consider who will receive that for which he deprives himself of much good in life. And that begins to vex him because who's going to get all of what I worked so hard for? On the other hand, the preacher saw great value in friendship. And he talks about the importance of working together and how people help one another in times of need. Now he stretches that out from verse five all the way on through verse 12. Then the chapter is closing with an illustration of a vanity of popularity. One of the things that troubles so many young people, but not just the adolescents, those in the years of adolescence, but even those older, that is they want to be liked by everybody. They want to be accepted by everybody. They want to think that other people think they have worth about them or value. And Many times that's just not the case. People can be terrible to one another and young people can certainly be that way with their fellow young people many times. We always see today a lot discussed in psychology on how do you deal with the bully and how do you deal with the one that's bullied? Uh, how do you deal with the person that's picked on because he or she's a little bit different from somebody else? How, how are you... Um, uh, how do you deal with those who are laughed at and mocked and made a lot of? Well, now think for a moment about the life of Christ in the flesh. And you can see that he underwent every bit of that. And he was perfect. He was sinless. He, by his life, showed us how to live a good life. So again, Ecclesiastes left to itself uh, is really without an answer, not the answer we want and the complete answer, but it's pointing us as a part of the volume that's a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It's pointing us to Christ in the New Testament so that we can understand that a person, if he's right with his God, if he's righteous, if he's godly, he's faithful, then other people can treat you all sorts of ways that are wicked. And yet you still have the peace and contentment that comes through knowing you're obedient to your Lord. He points out that while a young and wise man who becomes king may be very popular at first, but then with the passing of time, he ceases to be appreciated by those who come along later. And that's emphasized verse 13 through 16. Well, all they knew of and the kind of government was a monarchy. But now think today, think of how many presidents or even governors have been elected and people just think they're going to do wonders when they get in there. Everybody likes them. And they just think it's great. But along about two years later, three years later, uh, their ratings as far as popularity drop. Sometimes they deserve to drop. But the point is, you take any president we've ever had, or any senator, U.S. senator, or any governor, and he usually goes in office at the peak of his popularity, and then down he goes, uh, to a certain extent anyway, with a great many people. Now, that's, there's variations of that, but yet that's just about the way things work. 
And so people go through the process all over again. We've got to get a different person in the office, and that person will take care of everything. Well, people have been thinking that for a long time. And so it was even with absolute monarchies. And that leads us then to the end of the chapter in verse uh, 16. This is something that I would urge that parents do for their children is to try to get them to see that things that really matter aren't always going to be the things that most people or the majority of people like at all. Uh, if you go back and read the prophecies of Christ, then he is never pictured as a handsome person, as a person that would just appeal to you on the basis of being around him. Now, he astounded people because he was God in the flesh, and they were amazed at his teaching and all these things. Of course, he worked many miracles, which made people do things differently. But nevertheless, uh, he was not somebody that would uh, uh, be the most handsome movie star in the world and draw people to him in that way. His character is what drew people to him. And this is really the underlying teaching of Ecclesiastes. And one way or the other, the underlying teaching of the whole Bible is that what's the most important part about a human being? Well, it's his soul. Well, there's where you're going to see the character. What makes a person really what he is. When Jesus said, uh, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you know he wasn't talking about a physical body. God is spirit. He's, uh, he's uh, that which is perfect. And the perfect was dwelling in this human body that came through Mary. But what then did amaze people at Jesus? It was his character. And that's the point. And when you read Peter saying to us that he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps, well, that's not only in how he suffered, Notice that doesn't say here's how you handle fame. It says here's how you suffer. And suffer for the right reason. Suffer because you're right. Suffer because you're right and right being what the Bible says you're doing. So as we come into chapter five, uh, we want to notice the uh, uh, preacher's observations that are, again, gleaned from his search for the purpose of life. You'll see that that's going to be the thing that comes from all of this. That's the reason the book begins as it does. And it's to, he's described as he is. There, there could be nothing held back that was available for a person to enjoy during Solomon's day that Solomon couldn't enjoy. And that's the point. It doesn't make any difference how much more advanced we are in medicine or in technology. Uh, Solomon could enjoy things as much as anybody had the power to enjoy anything at that time. And if he were the same man today, he would enjoy everything the same way with all the advancements we have in technology and learning and so forth. But he said, all of that's vanity. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That's because none of it shows you really what life's all about, how you're to be living life. Life is about building a godly character. Thus Christ would say, uh, he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. That's not the way the world thinks. The world thinks like the way Solomon's presenting here, the way he saw happiness and contentment and peace and joy. Uh, people do not realize the advantage, um, or I guess the word is, I said advantage, that there is to learning that you get joy from service until people really learn that. And of course, as Christians, we know uh, service is directed by the Lord himself. We walk in his steps. But until people learn that service is the greatest thing to do and they deny themselves to follow the Lord, then there never will be much happiness anywhere with anybody. Um, you want to notice also in this chapter 
the proper way to approach God in worship. And uh, they were big on making vows. A vow is simply, I promise to do this and such. such. We may not, they may not have said it that way. But that's what it is. And what he's saying here is, if you promise somebody to do something, you do it. And you don't have really any choice. And therefore, the, one of the things is, don't make many vows. And certainly no most foolish things that you're going to do and will do when you know you can't do them. Well, it's very difficult to do them. And the third thing in chapter five is that we want to appreciate the limitation of riches and how the ability to enjoy them is a gift from God. You say, well, here, here's a person that does not even believe in deity. And he's a multi-billionaire. And then here's a person who is quite wealthy, but he earned his money, honestly. And that person is busy in using that money according to the teaching of the scriptures, such as practicing pure and undefiled religion, to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions. Well, just think of what good could be done today by helping widows and orphans. Uh, it was even especially so in this day and time, uh, all through the Bible period of those hundreds and hundreds of years, because there wasn't no money to take care of folks who couldn't feed themselves, who couldn't clothe themselves. Uh, orphans were just left to whatever would happen to them. Now, I haven't got time to do it, but you can do it. Go and read the Law of Moses, where it tells the children of Israel how to do things. And then remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. Your Jew wouldn't have a thing in the world to do with the Samaritan. But yet when one of their own is beaten, robbed, and left naked in bed, a Levite, who is from the tribe of Levi, the priestly bride, if you expect them to be as godly as they could be under the law, he goes by and has nothing to do with him. And here comes a priest himself. He won't do anything with him. But who really helps? The person that you wouldn't have anything to do with. And that's the Samaritan. And he's mindful of the needs of that person. Well, the whole idea of benevolence in the church is by showing people that we care in the sense of they can't clothe themselves or feed themselves is not an end within itself. It's the means to an end. There are people who honestly believe that nobody cares for them. Nobody cares at all for them, especially those who are in terrible shape financially or whatever thing like that where they can't even supply the basics of life. Now, I'm not talking about the person who doesn't want to work, doesn't intend to work, all that kind of thing. You got to realize in those days in certain parts of the world today, Lots and lots of people would dearly love to have a job to be able to work. And they are working, although they may not be paying but a few pennies a day in a lot of places. So those people are trying to supply for themselves various things. Well, you go in there to teach the gospel to them. You can show them you're caring for them by helping them as you can. You don't want to make it a situation to where they think that's all there is to it because you're going to teach the gospel to them. And that makes a difference. People who have no hope of physical advancement in this life, and it's gone that way for generations, and they may be under, and more likely are, false religions, and they hear the true story of the gospel, it gives them hope like we don't understand because most of us have been exposed to the truth of God's word more than most people ever have been. So having observed all kinds of folly during his search for the purpose of life, the preacher in chapter five uh, offers counsel on such things as worshiping God and making promises and seeing injustice in high places, and then properly using the money you got. 
assuming that any money a Christian would make has been earned, honestly, could have been inherited. But nevertheless, it's honest payment. Then they're going to want to use it in seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. So here he urges the writer to caution when one goes to the house of God. He says it's better to draw near to hear than to offer the sacrifices of fools. Well, that's another way of saying, as it's taught in the New Testament, uh, be quiet and listen and don't step in too fast. One of the things that young people could learn to do would be to listen to their elders. But we're not living in an age like that. Um, it's so easy to overload yourself with your mouth. <laughs> but what's being said here is don't do that. Just plain don't do that. Uh, so be careful, so very careful with what you say. Now, James gives a whole uh, list of things to Christians. He wrote this to Christians in James 1.26 about minding your tongue. And he tells us all along through James 1 that the tongue is unruly. Uh, he basically says you can't completely control it. But your job is to control it. How do you control your tongue? But if your mind is not in gear with the truth, you won't do a good job with it. But that's the idea. And you won't make rash promises and boast about things that people like to do. Of course, as I said, they made vows, which were promises. And he says, you do that, you better fulfill your promise. And you think about what could be taught within a home concerning children, my mom and daddy, when it comes to teaching them that when you tell somebody you're going to do something, you do it. Uh, when you, you tell somebody you be there on time, you be there on time, this kind of thing. And when you start that that way and apply it in every area of a child's life, you're training that child to be responsible. But so many today aren't that way. If you talk to anybody that owns a business or operates a business, and you talk to them about their employees, you'll see that they're not dependable overall. They may not halfway work if they're there. And you can't, you never know whether they're honest or not. Many others sometimes try to get out of the work they're hired to do. So that did not used to be the case. Oh, even some people like that. It's obvious you've got it set here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But the point is, there was a time when this country itself, the United States, had more of this kind of principle ingrained in the families as to the desire to work, honest work, hard work, fulfill your promises. So he's talking about that. Um, we don't let our mouth get ourselves into trouble and then try to make an excuse as to why you didn't perform the promise. I think it's interesting that when you look at one through seven, he concludes in seven, for in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. But then he says, but fear thou God. In other words, God is going to have to be accounted to for promises made and not kept. Now, when you start here um, in verse eight, he's going to return to what he was discussing earlier in chapter three. 16 and 17, and in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And he says, I don't be amazed when you see the oppression of the poor or the perversion of justice and righteousness. And he says, you remember this, that everyone answers to someone higher. That, to me, would be one of the greatest things to get across to people today. The president of the United States are always going to answer to somebody higher. The justices of the Supreme Court, kings, queens, potentates, whatever they are in civil government or in any other position of authority, there's always someone higher to whom they must give an account. And 
the king usually, that is the monarch, could be a queen, uh, usually they must realize that if enough people get upset with them, then they'll find out how quickly those people can overthrow them. So even the king is dependent to a great extent upon those who serve him. He, in other words, will be held accountable ultimately to God, but also to the people whom he serves. Now think for a minute, when we say a king or a queen serves the people, he's not just in there to accumulate wealth and spend it all over himself while he taxes the people and makes them live in poverty. So if all people in government had the idea that we want to help the popular, the, the popular people, the populace, it would make a world of difference as to what they do. And another recurrent thought throughout the preacher's observation, and notice how he, the, the things that are really important he keeps coming back to, they keep popping out. And that's the proper use of riches. But we just mentioned that in a moment ago. Uh, he talks about the pointlessness, the vanity of loving riches. And of course, we know what's said in the New Testament about the love of money is the root of all evil. Literally, it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, then there's the actual hoarding of riches to where other people suffer. You don't do anything with it. You're just happy to have it. Thus, riches in and of themselves alone simply don't satisfy. They create anxiety and they can easily perish through some kind of misfortune. And that's what he brings out in verse 10 all the way down through verse 17. Now, verse 11, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? What does that mean then that Money itself is wrong. No, it's the attitude you have toward it. Money, you just do so many good things. Money, when Paul was trying to help the poor saints, the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea in that area, he collected money from all these churches and took it down there. So it's, he's the one who wrote that the love of money is root of all kinds of evil. Well, then why is he collecting money? Well, this goes to show you money uh, sought after and thought of in the wrong way is bad. And if you love it enough to where it becomes the center of your being, it'll cause you to do all sorts of things. But when money is used to seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness, to practice pure and undefiled religion, then money becomes a great tool. And so it's sort of like saying the scalpel's a great thing in a doctor's hands and knows how to use it. But put that scalpel in a murderer's hands, it's another story indeed, same scalpel, but the mind behind it is totally different. Um, in verses 18 through 20, he talks about how it's uh, an enjoyable thing to see the good in one's labor, see the results of one's labor. But the ability to enjoy is a gift from God. Now let's think about that for a minute. What makes a human being have the ability to enjoy something? Now think about that for a minute. It's the same thing that allows a human being to love God or to be a just person, or we talk about a sense of oughtness. All of that comes from the fact that that's imprinted upon our spirit. Now, we can enjoy the law thing because we don't believe in God, we don't follow his word, but we still have the sense of enjoying something. But when you allow your minds to be directed by the word of God, we today in the church, we're Christians, then we are full of joy when we see people living right, obeying the gospel, 
uh, restored the Lord. Uh, we rejoice with him that rejoices, as Paul says. Uh, we're happy when other people are happy. We're not envious of them. We're not jealous of them. But we're happy because they're happy and happy over the right thing. Notice when the Ethiopian eunuch was obedient to the gospel, he knew he was reconciled to God. His sins were remitted. He went on his way rejoicing. So that's the point that's being made here. It's fitting then to enjoy these things. Uh, to have this kind of joy in one's inner man is a character trait. Um, you should be happy when people are in terrible straits. Uh, we, should, we should sorrow with those that sorrow. What gives me the ability as a human being to, to sorrow, same thing, it gives me the ability to rejoice. I must be directed, though, by God. And that only comes to the study of God's word. And so that's the point made in 18, uh, 18 through 20 here. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it's his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. So when you look at, at the Solomon, and you see, he says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You got to realize, from what perspective does he say that? Well, he, he's not saying it here. He's saying about the opposite. So you pick up these th things that come out before you ever get to the end of the book where he says, that's the conclusion of the whole matter. He's saying, what he's saying is there's not a thing in the world wrong. In fact, it's right for a person who's worked hard and honestly and earned something to be happy over, to rejoice. And especially when as a Christian today, we make application of the church, we use it, spread the gospel to help the church grow and so on and so forth. Um, to go over here to another place. And I will go about another five minutes, I think. You'll see my voice is kind of not working too well right now. But we're looking at chapter six. Again, keep in mind, we say this all the time with all the books, there were no chapters and verses in these books. So, in fact, they weren't even books originally, they were with scrolls. That's one reason you'll hear Paul saying in another place he said this or that, because it was, they had no chapters and verses. So you just going to say, in Isaiah, in a certain place, it says such and such. Uh, frankly, that tells me why I'm glad that somebody went in and put the chapters and verses in there. <laughs> Sometimes I think they could have put the chapters ending in another place than they did, but at least gives us a chance to be able to say, uh, easily find what we're talking about. Well, in chapter six, uh, again, the book is designed for you to reflect upon what he said. It's not designed just to read through it and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You reflect on it, the sensible world, how does this involve my life? What's this doing in my life? So we're to reflect upon his observation that he gleaned from his search for the purpose of life. And he continues on to point out there are limitations to riches. And he says, as I read a moment ago, that the gift to enjoy them comes from God. Now think about that for a minute. Do you ever think about the, the, the ability you have to enjoy what your money can buy, money earned honestly, and a righteous thing that you're buying? What makes you be happy over that? So those things are designed to say, you need to have a character that knows what to be happy about, knows what to rejoice over. Even when you're buying something, think about 
you hear it sometimes or you have in the past. I think you see here today. I'm so thankful we've got money to put groceries on the table. A lot of people don't. Even in our society, a lot of people don't. I'm not talking about it could be their fault, but I'm saying there's still lots of votes. Uh, on the news yesterday, I think, talking about the heat, at least the last few days, and usually it's on the news every day, we have a heat wave like this. But there was an elderly lady that kept her air conditioner turned off all during the day in the window. And she said, I have to save up my money to be able to pay my electric bill. But I don't know how many people think about that. Now, again, I don't know how she handles the money she's got, how much she's got coming in. But nevertheless, it's ridiculous to say there are people like that in that kind of situation and far worse. Um, if you're looking, uh, he started this kind of thing back over in, in chapter 5, 13 through 20, where he's discussing the vanity of riches. And he describes a, a sad, but it's a very common situation. And that is a man blessed with riches, blessed with wealth and blessed with honor so that he has all that he desires. Here's the thing, yet God does not let him have it, and it's consumed by someone else. Such a man, even if he has a hundred children and lives 2,000 years, is described as no better than a stillborn child. Look at how verses 1 through 6 read. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it's common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God give them not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity and it's an evil disease, the way he described it. Well, that sort of reminds you of the rich farmer who had such a crop. He says, I don't have enough barn to put it in. I'll tear those down, build bigger barns. Well, God called that in a food. And he didn't get to use any of what he had. He goes on in verse 3, if a man begat a hundred children, live many years, notice. And then he says in verse 4, for he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. Well, uh, it goes back to what we said about the book in the beginning, that much of what he's saying is, if you're going to go this route, to where you're material-minded, and you're going to live in this world like that's all there is to life, is material gain, here's what you can expect. And it's vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, I don't know how, how else you could say it, but in that way. So uh, his reflections on riches lead him to conclude that man's labor uh, might feed his mouth, but it doesn't really satisfy the soul. Now we're back to what I said earlier. What are we all about in this life? Basically, character building. And that's soul building, soul making. It's better to have the sight of the eyes, that is, so you can enjoy what you see, than to have the wandering of desire, which is vanity and grasping at the whim. That's why so many people are dissatisfied with the things they have. They don't have to be a multimillionaire, uh, they can just be grasping after it. They think here is the here is the source of happiness. Well, they never get it. They waste their life in seeking after it. They come to the end of their life, they still haven't got it. And now what? They're coming to the end of their life and there's nothing there to look to. Um, since man can't change that he is subject to life's vanities, we all are. What is under men once dying after that judgment? Uh, you, you, I don't care how godly you are, you're going to die unless the Lord comes back for us. So we're subject to all the things any human being is subject to. Some, I mean, have you ever asked yourself, why, why, why was I not born in India? Why was I not born in Indonesia and in Africa or in China? That's where most of the world's population is. And they're living in squalor, many of them, without even the knowledge of uh, experience of a free government 
false religions go in India for the most part, Indonesia. Uh, China is this bore down on by communism and their Buddhism and whatever they've got there. Well, because we have these blessings, it just so, should make us even more thankful and more determined to use them to serve God. He asked, <clears throat> who knows what is good in this short life? And who can tell what will happen in this life after we're gone? When he does that, then he's implying that only God provides the answer to the vanity of life under the sun, 7 through 12. That's the reason I say this, any of the Old Testament, but this book itself finds complete fulfillment in the New Testament. It points directly to Christ. Christ said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now think for a minute. What is the book of Ecclesiastes he's talking about? How people try to find the abundant life and miss it. And when they do, vanity, vanity, all in vanity. So he's saying you have all these things that are physical. God puts you in a material world. He gave you physical appetites. You have physical needs. You live with other people who are that way too. So how do you keep all of these things in their proper perspective? Because he says here, there's folks who don't. And when they begin to find or seek security, peace and happiness and joy in the affairs of this present world as if there's nothing else, that's when all the vanity and vexation of spirit so not the accumulation of health, or rather wealth, does one uh, gain happiness and so forth. It's the accumulation of right knowledge and consistent steadfast practice of it. And then as Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am in to be content. Now there's a big difference in being content and satisfied. I don't think any faithful child of God is going to be satisfied till he hears, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But Paul says, I've learned. Didn't mean he always knew it, but he had learned to be content in whatsoever state he was in. Uh, that means I know the brevity and uncertainty of life and flesh, and I'm leaving this world. So let me be content with such things as we have and learn to use them in harmony with Matthew 6.33. And that's the way that you shape a character in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Well, for those here in the classroom, let me ask, do you have any questions? Anything you like? I'm trying to move this on by covering still the main points. I think you'll see if you read the chapters that I'm not missing those, I don't think. Um, but that's six of them. There are six more to go. Still in 10th of eight. Um, we'll see if we can't move on and see how far we get in August. So we're glad everybody came our way. We share everybody the best. We didn't have prayer when we started out, so let's have prayers and close. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful we can be together this evening to study this book, Ecclesiastes. Help us to let it help us to have the proper view of material things, how we use them as thy children. Defeat us in all things contrary to thy will. Raise us up in that which is good, that thy name might be glorified and so saved. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.